Usually the sight of a lawyer standing up to talk about contract law is enough to empty a room. So I appreciate you staying in place and thank you very much. Um, my name is Simon Fraser. I am a construction lawyer with Hussey Fraser Solicitors. Before becoming a lawyer, I worked as a civil engineer. So I have some idea of the practicalities and, and the, uh, the issues involved in, in work on site. Um, what I want to talk about today, in, in fact, a uh, former Taoiseach is once reported to have said at a cabinet meeting, that's all very well in practice, but will it work in theory? And with BIM, I want to rephrase that question slightly differently this morning uh, and ask the question, well, all this BIM is very good in practice, but will it work in the potential minefield that we have with the public works contracts here in Ireland? And what I'd like to do is provide an overview, um, and it won't be a detailed session, you please know in relation to the Construction Industry Council BIM protocol, which has been produced this year, and to make some suggestions how it can be used or incorporated into the public works contracts, which we have in Ireland. And I think that that can contribute to a better contractual environment here in Ireland. What, what my submission is, is that the PWC suite can be made BIM ready with only minor amendments, that that can assist in more collaborative working in the industry in Ireland, and that much work has already been done. We don't have to start from scratch. In fact, you know, a lot of the presentations that have been made at this gathering are testament to the amount of work that's already been done. And also that we have an opportunity to move in this direction right now. And by way of setting the background a little more, I'd just like to draw some of the messages that have come out in the gathering so far, which I think are consistent with, with, with my presentation. Uh, it was very positive to see the Minister, Brian Hayes, open the, the gathering and s tell us that BIM is on the government agenda. Celine McHugh from Forfuss talked about the importance of the construction industry to the economy in Ireland, but also noted that the public works contracts as they currently operate, currently operate are seen as being a constraint and a hindrance to the industry moving forward. Uh, David Philp from the Cabinet Office talked about the BIM task group in the UK and how much work they have done and the public uh, accessible standards that they've produced there. And I think we have an opportunity to leverage off a lot of that good work. Um, Melanie Dawson indeed talked about the CIC regional hub which has been set up in the north of Ireland. And John Hunt from Enterprise Ireland who's operating in the UK talked about the importance to Irish companies that are competing in the international marketplace and particularly in the UK to having a BIM background and a BIM um, competence in order to compete. And he advocated a development of, of a strong BIM culture in Ireland. And then we had John Dean from B DIT who talked about his own research um, in this area and the fact that there has not been any great impetus to take up BIM out there um, in the Irish construction industry. And he was advocating that we need top-down drivers from the government to, to start the, this process rolling forward, and, and I would agree with that. So a lot of you here will know a lot about the public works contracts, um, and for those who don't, they were introduced in 2007 by the Department of Finance. And the interesting thing about them is that they're a totally new set of contracts. We developed from a white sheet of paper, we have produced a, a form of contract and a suite of contracts that are not used anywhere else in the world. So in the past, we would have taken contracts that would be typically used in common law jurisdictions and, and, and use them in Ireland for construction work, but these are a totally new form. They're a standard suite of contracts in that the contracts for the different areas are all similar, can be easily read, and the contracts form part of a larger framework, which is the Capital Works framework, which addresses every stage of a project from conception to management and facilities management. 
And the purpose of the contracts when they were introduced was to bring cost certainty and value for money, and nobody can argue with that. Obviously, they're very good things. But it was interesting to note that in the guidance notes that came with the contracts, they said that a high level of comprehensive quality information should allow for a high level of risk transfer. And what this effectively meant was a transfer of risk from the employer to the contractor. But it has to be noted that that would be accompanied by a high level of quality information. And I don't want this to sound like a, a big moaning session about the public works contracts, but I think it is identified that there are problems with them, but there's a lot of good things as well. I mean, they, they are um, a one-stop shop. They use standard definitions, standard layouts. They are easy to read. They include current work practices and program, work programs and site meetings are all included in the contracts. These um, practices were not catered for in the older contracts. They're clear, comprehensive, they allow for current legislation, health and safety, late payment regulations, all of them are included. And they relate to all the modern stages of, of the construction process. So they are modern and they are up to date. However, there are a number of difficulties. Um, what has, has happened is that the contracts have allowed the transfer of risk without the required high level of comprehensive information. There are a number of clauses uh, in, the, in the contracts which I consider to be unfair <coughs> when that quality information are, has not been transferred. Uh, there are clauses to do with program contingency, consents, delay events, compensation events, claims, arbitration, and background information, which are all very restrictive, very protective of the employer, and make it very risky for the contractor in, in contracting under these um, suite. The other thing that the contracts do is they, they, they codify the traditional adversarial position um, in relation to the contracts. Um, so the old um, us and them, situation is maintained and that has to be seen in the context of other jurisdictions moving in a different direction. We, we heard this morning about the Australian Alliance contract. In, in the UK the Cabinet Office looked at this around about the 90s when Michael Latham produced a report entitled Partnering in Construction and the direction that the UK took from that report was more towards collaboration and partnership. We took a step in the other direction and we introduced new contracts which, as I say, solidify the traditional adversarial position. And in my opinion, these, this represented a missed opportunity, a missed opportunity to move in a more partner, collaborative kind of direction. Now, there is a clause in the contracts entitled duty to cooperate, or to do, duty to collaborate, excuse me. And while that is there, unfortunately, it doesn't contain any sanctions. So it, 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 it's, a, it's an aspiration, but there's no sanction if one doesn't cooperate. Um, so it has, doesn't have any teeth. And in my view, these contracts have so far not, not de delivered on the benefits that they promised. Now, just to, a lot of you will be, from, be familiar with the Capitals Works framework, and I won't go into this in any detail, but, but True to course, I haven't got one picture or diagram in my slides, they're all text. So, uh, but this illustrates the fact that the Capital Works Framework covers every aspect of the, of the construction process. And the contracts only fit in at stage three of the project stages, their implementation. That's where the Public Works contract itself fits. But as you can see, the whole framework is a large um, piece of work. And in order to address BIM fully, it would be necessary to, to amend the Capital Works framework for a full BIM environment. And in fact, John Deeney talked about that yesterday. He was talking about putting another layer into the Capital Works management framework to allow for, for BIM. But the message that 
I think came out from David Phillips' presentation in particular yesterday was that there has been an awful lot of work done in this area already. So help is at hand. Um, as we've heard several times in the, at the gathering, the government in the UK have got a stra strategy to have BAME to level three in place on all its projects by 2016. And the industry in the UK and the, the, the government have invested a huge amount of money already in this area. So we have the UK BIM task group, um, we have the British Standards Institution and the Construction Industry Council, all producing documents, all doing excellent work, and we are in a position to, to benefit from, from this. So if we just look at one of the... So, So, for instance, the British Standard Institute have produced um, what they call PASS, which are public, publicly accessible specifications. And these set out in great detail um, the information standards and the processes and procedures that can be used to implement BIM. Um, there is a PASS 91 of 2013 which specifically addresses what kind of questions you should ask at a pre-qualification stage in order to assess the competence of bidders um, as regards BIM. So there's also employers' information requirements and best practice guides for professional indemnity insurance. So a lot of documents out there which are very beneficial, a lot of work being done. And one of the documents that has been produced is the Construction Industry Council BIM Protocol the first edition of which was produced this year. Now, I'm not going to go into the protocol in huge detail. I think what I want to do is give you an awareness that it's out there and that it can be used. Um, but what the protocol is designed to do is it's designed to fit in with existing standard contracts. So the, the current contracts do not have to be amended in any significant way in order to make the contracts BIM ready. Minimum amount of changes, and the primary objective is to enable BIM production models at defined stages of a project. The BIM protocol seeks to encourage collaboration of all the parties in the use, production, and delivery of models, and the responsibility is with the employer to put the protocols in place. Now, in particular, when most of the construction work that's being tendered at the moment in Ireland is being tendered by the government and so it, it comes under the public works contracts um, it, it's specifically it is important that the government would come on board and that it would be driven from that level um, in making tenders um, tender is required to, to have BIM competence and to answer the tender um, with, a, with a plan for BIM so it sets out, the, the BIM protocol sets out the duty to produce and deliver models at defined levels of detail. And it protects the uh, intellectual property rights subsisting in the information in the models by the, the IPR rests with the person who owns the data right from the beginning. So just to give you a brief, brief overview of the CIC protocol, it's, it's very short. It's got a model enabling an amendment, which is the amendment that goes into your contract to say that the CIC protocol has, uh, has effect. It's just eight clauses and two appendices. Um, the model enabling an amendment, as I've said. The definitions are ones that you might expect. It uh, creates a new role, information management role. Um, it defines what level of detail means. Um, Material has is, is got the definition of information in any electronic medium prepared by or on behalf of the project team member. The model, uh, what uh, the permitted purpose is the purpose that you're entitled to use the information for. The project team member would, in our um, language, normally be a contractor. And then there are other project team members who are other members of the team. Thank you. Okay, I'll skip to this quickly. Um, so you've got a clause in relation to priority, priority of contracts. Um, 
contract documents, which you would expect. There's the obligations of the employer, what the, what the employer has to do. The most significant one is that the employer has to define what his information requirements are going to be, what the um, project or the, the model delivery time frame is going to be, and has to appoint an information manager. Made that mistake already. Clause 4 deals with the obligations of the project team member. As I said, that's usually the contractor in our language. The contractor had to produce the specified models, deliver the models, use the models from others, and comply with the information requirements. Then, as I say, the use of the model, the copyright remains with the <coughs> contractor who produces the model, and the, the use of the information is done on a licensing um, system whereby the owner of the information licenses the other party to use it and also can provide sub-licenses to other people to use it. So that's how the model is, is used. Licenses can be revoked for non-payment and you've no right to amend information that's being provided by others. Once you've been provided with the information um, and the model, there's no, there's no liability in respect of any modification or amendment to the materials that others might might make to the to the data, um, and if this contract terminates, the rights of the employer to use the model still continues, which would be important. The appendix then um, to the, the protocol sets out the technical issues to do with level of detail, uh, who's got to produce the information by when, um, at the various stages of the project and then the information requirements are set out in the second appendix. So in my submission, the PWC suite do not require major amendments to make them BIM ready. We heard already about the ongoing review by the government of the PWC suite and we think that this is a great opportunity to introduce BIM and move the contracts in a more collaborative and partnership direction. Um, there's a lot of information done out there, a lot of work being done out there. Uh, we can leverage from that. And I think that there is an opportunity to improve the contracting environment for the benefit of all and move the contracts in the right direction. Thank you very much.